The governing body could be likened to the voice of Jesus, the head of the congregation. So when we willingly submit to the faithful slave, we're ultimately submitting to Jesus' authority and direction. How did we get to this point? For decades now, the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses, who operate in New York City, have claimed to be chosen by Jesus himself to lead his true followers into everlasting life. They call themselves the faithful slave, claiming to fulfill a prophecy found in Matthew 24-45, even though this was never a prophecy but a parable or whatever. For decades now, the faithful slave has instructed all JWs to obey their instructions, since obeying them means that they're obeying Jehovah himself. But now, in 2023, Watchtower has asserted that this group of nine men is not only chosen by Jesus, but the voice of Christ himself. Let's listen to this talk by Kenneth Flodin, helper to the teaching committee, as he explains to us why we should submit to the governing body, I'm, I mean, to Jesus. So Kenneth starts his talk talking a few minutes about the yoke of Jesus. Now, in the Bible text, Jesus says that his yoke is light and refreshing. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am mild-tempered and lowly in heart, and you will find refreshment for yourselves. Verse 30 adds the detail, for my yoke is kindly and my load is light. But the way Watchtower defines a yoke is the complete opposite. Now the yoke is an illustration. Our publications have applied it to Jesus putting his yoke on us. Let's extend the illustration a little. Farmers often train their oxen to respond to verbal commands so that they could keep their hands on the plow and not have to deal with the reins and the plow. The governing body could be likened to the voice of Jesus, the head of the congregation. So when we willingly submit to the faithful slave, we're ultimately submitting to Jesus' authority and direction. And that nicely harmonizes with Matthew 28, 18 through 10, 20. Uh, you recall, Jesus had considerable authority as a human on earth. So because Jesus had authority as a human being, does that mean that the governing body is also entitled to the same level of authority? Well, back to Matthew eleven twenty nine, It says, if we take that yoke, we will find refreshment for ourselves. That sounds wonderful, doesn't it? Relaxing, luxurious, sweet refreshment. Yep, seems that's what Jesus meant. But that's not the intent. Ugh, now Kenneth's going to reinterpret the text to fit his dogma. A yoke does not represent a vacation. A yoke in and of itself implies work. A farmer does not put cattle in a yoke and send them out to graze in a refreshing pasture. He puts them in a yoke to accomplish work. Yes, Kenneth, that's what a yoke usually implies, hard work. But Jesus turned that concept on its head and said that his yoke is light and refreshing. It's irony, a literary device. Did he not go to school, Kenneth? Well, Jesus now has authority in heaven. So the resurrected anointed one's refreshment does not mean floating on a cloud, strumming a harp, as Christendom sometimes suggests. Jesus' personality did not change when he went to heaven, and a yoke refers to meaningful work. But Jesus is mild-tempered, so that work is kindly and refreshing. And just think of the near future. Try to imagine all of the anointed following Jesus' direction at Armageddon. They're going to assist in dismantling Satan's entire wicked system. Dismantling Satan's system? That, well, that's a fancy way of saying murdering 8 billion people who don't submit to the governing body. That is work. Is it really? I mean, an angel could kill 185,000 Assyrians in one night. How hard could it be for 144,000 anointed people to murder 8 billion humans? 
That's around 55,000 people per anointed. Yeah, I did the math. How difficult could that be for an immortal spirit person? But since it's under Jesus' direction, that work is refreshing, it's invigorating, it's fulfilling. And for those of us on earth, refreshment does not mean lounging in our favorite easy chair with the beverage of our choice. We have work to do. But the yoke is padded, it's kindly, we don't chafe under it. Jesus is mild-tempered. In his illustration about the yoke, Jesus never even mentions work. Watchtower has infused the verse with a meaning that is simply not there. <laughs> Watchtower is so obsessed with work, numbers, and output that they take this verse talking about rest and refreshment and turn it into a command to work hard. <laughs> what a yoke! Now back to Matthew eleven twenty nine. Did you notice Jesus said, and learn from me? Why did he include those words? The sentence would have made perfect sense without them. But he specifically said, and learn from me. Now, why might that be significant? Well, what about contrast? Who had Jesus' followers learned from all their lives? It was the religious leaders of the day. What a contrast between their attitude and personality when compared with Jesus. Matthew chapter 23, please. His disciples had learned from the scribes and Pharisees, and so they had picked up uh, flaws in their attitude and personality. And as we read Matthew 23, 4, please allow Matthew eleven thirty 30 to be ringing in your ear. Do you recall? Jesus said, my load is light. Well, what had the disciples learned previously from the religious leaders, 23, 4? They bind up, not light, but heavy loads and put them on the shoulders of men. It's incredible to me how floating doesn't immediately collapse from the irony. So does the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses behave themselves like Jesus or the Pharisees? Let's find out. The governing body demands a lot from their followers, both physically, mentally, and emotionally. Jehovah's Witnesses are constantly told to do more, to knock on more doors, to perform more Bible studies, to spend more hours preaching, to donate more often. They're told to suppress their sexuality, to shun their loved ones who left, to sacrifice their financial stability on behalf of this religion, and to be willing to martyr themselves for the dogma. The life of a Jehovah's Witness is the definition of a heavy load. And the craziest part is that most of these roles are not even based on the Bible. <laughs> Just like the Pharisees of Jesus' day made up all kinds of rules not based on the Torah. And if you glance at verse 5, you'll see that they like to piously be seen by men. They like the most prominent seats at meals in the synagogue. Yeah, that absolutely describes the governing body, especially now that they've entered their televangelist phase. They show off how pious they are when they perform photo shoots in front of disaster victims. I lost my family members, and temporarily I lost my trust in God. The elders told me it was okay to cry because it would get what was in my heart out into the open. Just like the Pharisees, the governing body couldn't resist putting themselves in the spotlight, even though they could have chosen to remain in the shadows, away from the admiration of the public. But now verse 11. Learn from Jesus. He said, but the greatest among you must be your minister. Do you remember an entrenched personality flaw of the apostles? They often defaulted into arguing about who's the greatest one among us. They likely learned that from the religious leaders' poor example. So it makes sense in our text today that Jesus pleaded, learn from me. In effect, I am different, learn. I am mild-tempered and lowly in heart. While the yoke of Jesus does definitely include disciple-making, Nope, the verse never mentions such a thing. We need to learn Jesus in all aspects of Christian discipleship. 1 Peter 2.21, it says, He left a model for us to follow his steps closely. That verse 
the context does not talk about the preaching word. It's talking about dealing with suffering and interpersonal relationships. For example, 3.1, it says, in the same way as the model, you wives be in subjection to your husband. 3.7, it says, in the same way, husbands treat your wife. In verse chapter 3, verse 8, it's addressed to all of us interacting with one another. It has four beautiful Christ-like qualities we need to display with one another. Now, it's true, due to imperfection, and misunderstandings, we all make mistakes. But the baseline is, learn from Jesus, including the fact that he was mild-tempered and lowly in heart. Well, if the governing body actually acted like Jesus, things would be very different in the Watchtower, wouldn't they? The hungry would be fed, the poor would be sheltered, children could be protected, and family members would not be shunned. And one thing is for sure, if the governing body actually followed Jesus, they would not be claiming they are his boys. Since that goes against Jesus' very warning at Matthew 24, wouldn't the boys of Jesus be in the Gospels already? Saying you are the boys of Christ implies that Christ's words are insufficient. <laughs> Watchtower keeps putting me in this awkward position where I'm not even a believer anymore but I'm still defending the Gospels and calling them out on their awful interpretation of the text. Even if I don't believe, this talk still feels incredibly blasphemous. <laughs> like I mentioned in the beginning, the governing body has claimed plenty of times in the past to be chosen by Jesus. That's nothing new. In fact, most Christians believe, at least on an individual level, that they have been chosen by Christ himself. But to claim to be the voice of Jesus now that is something new, and I think this sort of explicit language will only increase as the years go by. The next logical thing is for the governing body to claim they are Jesus, or at least a manifestation of Jesus. <laughs> you might think that's never gonna happen, but hey, I imagine this kind of talk would never happen, and guess what? Here we have it, cults gonna cult. And claiming to be the voice of Jesus opens up all sorts of fascinating questions. If the governing body can make mistakes, then does that mean that Jesus also makes mistakes? And if a governing body member is kicked out and his talks are erased, does that mean that the voice of Jesus can be wrong and should be erased as well? If the voice of Jesus means everlasting life, does that mean that the ramblings of Stephen Lett are also everlasting life? <laughs> If the governing body says something that contradicts the words of Jesus, who has more authority? And if the governing body is the voice of Christ, then what do we need Jesus for? Doesn't this make him an outdated prophet? Why would we want to listen to the limited catalog of words found in the Gospels when we could just stick to the governing body's unlimited array of wisdom? I don't need sleep, I need answers. So let me know what you thought of this talk in the comments below. It's one of the craziest things I've heard in a while, but I think this is just going to become more and more common as the years go by. So brace yourselves, we're just getting started. If you enjoyed my work and would like to support my channel with a small donation, please follow the links that I provide below or check me out on Patreon so you can get early access to all my videos. Alright, take it easy guys, have a wonderful day, and stay away from the tower.